Hello and welcome to Hair in the Hawthorn. I hope you're all well and thank you for joining us again. We have a reoccurring guest today and one that's always the ple always a pleasure to, to have on board. Um, I would like to give this person a new title and it was something that sprang up a couple of days ago and I don't want to shock you, Simon, but in my mind, you are the fairy godfather. <laughs> that that's, that's that's what I'm going for. So we've got Dr. Simon Young. Um, if you want a, a bit more of a, a, a rounded introduction to who Simon is and what he's about, there is a, a video uh, we did. I think it was a couple of years ago. It seems like too too long ago uh, where I chatted to Simon about. Uh, what he does, who he is, in a, in a bit more in depth. Today, we're going to look at a couple of specific topics um, and we're going to run it from there. So I want to welcome Dr. Simon Young to the virtual sofa. Hi, Simon. How are you doing? Great, thanks. Lovely, lovely to be back and particularly to be back with Neil this time. Yeah, it's always lovely to have Neil on board. Yeah, he's, that's right. Yeah, he's, he's, I don't know whether I'm the sidekick or Neil's the sidekick. I think we uh, we inter you know sort of traverse that one between us. I'm going to pass you over to Neil. He's going to kick us off with with the first question. We're going to sort of meander around a few subjects. So over to you, Neil. Thank you, Kate, um, and uh, thank you, Simon, for uh, agreeing to do this. It's really fantastic to have you on. Um, we've both been following your work for many years. And um, and well, you are now the godfather of fairy. That's um, that's official. Well done, Kate. Um, <laughs> so where, uh, I, I think I first came across you, met, I don't know how many years ago, it was seven, eight years ago now, via the Fairy Investigation Society, which I'd been dimly aware of before that for, for, for a few years and then started to find out this society goes a little bit deeper than I, I had thought. Now, I think many of the people watching this who subscribe to Heron Hawthorne will know about the, the Fairy Investigation Society, but there are some people who probably won't. So do, do you want to give us a, a kind of potted history of how this society developed and your current own role in it? OK, great. Yes. So I think there were, there were two phases. Um, the first is that in the 1920s, so a century ago now, it's incredible to think of it like that, um, a number of London-based mystics and intellectuals set up the Fairy Investigation Society. Um, and it was spelt in various ways and there were they did different formats and they even brought out a magazine. But chiefly, the Fairy Investigation Society format seems to have been in this period an excuse for fairy enthusiasts to meet. And it was very much, a, it had a theosophic bent. So the people who were involved were also involved in circles of spiritualists and circles of theosophy generally. They would get together in the evening. They would have various discussions. Um, the society seemed to burn out before the Second World War. But after the Second World War, and I just saw Neil reaching for the relevant books, so we have a queue coming up. <laughs> after the Second World War, a young woman, a then young woman, Marjorie Johnson, um, took over the society. Uh, she, she basically brought it back from the dead. And this is Marjorie's work. Um, it was published, unfortunately, post-mortem. Um, it's called Seeing Fairies, and it's basically the collection of her records over 60 years of collecting different fairy sightings. Um, and Marjorie Johnson kept the society going for the best part of 20 years. And then again, it fell into abeyance. Um, and I, and here, I, I hope I'm going to get my dates right, but in the early 2010s, I started... I came across references to this society and I was really, really curious about it. I think it pushed some of my buttons. And so I started doing what research I could. I discovered the figure of Marjorie Johnson. And I remember early on being very disappointed to discover that she died just a year before. Um, I just missed her. She lived till I, I think 101, 102. Yes. Um, and so I, the, the honour fell to me to, I, I, in doing this research, I came across a manuscript that she had created. And this is the book that Neil has just shown us. 
Um, and it, it, the honour fell to me to prepare this for publication with Anomalous Press. Um, and I was very happy to do this. And in the introduction to this book, I suggested that it would be good um, first to re-found the Fairy Investigation Society. Um, and second also, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit later today, to do a fairy census um, that, that followed in Marjorie's footsteps. But I think the one difference was this, that I... I was more ecumenical than the original members in the 20s or Marjorie Johnson in the 50s in that I, I tried to create a society that would appeal to anyone who was interested in fairies, whatever their standpoint was. So, of course, there are lots of people um, in the Fairy Investigation Society today who are fairy believers. I, my suspicion, we've never done a survey, but my suspicion is the majority and probably even the vast majority but then there are a number of more perhaps agnostic people like myself. And then there are also a small number of people who are actively and very openly, not hostile, but sceptical about these things, but interested in them as phenomena. And so there's this idea that people come from different points of view. And Marjorie Johnson, I mean, the, the first iteration of the society, people used to get together in London. Marjorie Johnson used to send out a newsletter maybe once a year um, over a number of years. Um, and she also sometimes arranged different members of the society got together and perhaps went on trips to look for fairies. And the new Fairy Investigation Society, which has now been going for, I mean, the best part of a decade, um, I had I, I, it's the first time I've said this out loud, but it's it's longer than it seems. Um, I think I'm right in saying that there are now about 500 members and it basically boils down to this, that twice a year, a digital newsletter goes out. Um, there's also this club on Facebook, which is for members. Um, and there's some discussion there and there's lots of DMing behind the scenes um, personally, I, I'm not a great one for social media, but I've met some really fantastic people there. Um, and then last year at the suggestion of one of the members, uh, this is Reem, we, we set up a, a mini library as well that members can sign into with digital publications, not so much from the last 20 years, but from before there. So there's this little modest fairy library and hope we hopefully we can add to this with time. I mean, it's it's yeah. not. It, it, go on. Sorry, Kate, go. On. I was oh, just right, going right. to say it's it's a it's a uh, it's a wealth of knowledge to tap into. Just from my perspective, meeting people like Neil, uh, Joe Hickey Hall, and and other people that we've we've interviewed on here, that's all come out of the Fair Investigation Society, and we've also had suggestions for this program. But in terms of resources. Um, you know, you have a question about uh, wanting a, a specific on, on fairy or folklore, and there is always somebody to sort of point you in, in the right direction. So it may be, you know, a vast majority of people who believe in fairies, but I think the distinct difference is that people also have a good knowledge base of, yeah. of um, and modern fairy folklore, if, if, if nothing else. And I, I, and I find that that lovely about it. Well, really sure, sure, before... before 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 you say anything more simon we, sh we should just say that everything is free yes. it's very i i know it's all very important to you for the you know there's no membership fee um anyone can join um and i think i think that's that's really important i like i like that 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 the, the the free nature of it so as not to put any kind of barrier to to anyone who might be not be able to afford if you put a subscription fee on it is, is that something you purposely did so this is something i i just I, i'm a great fan of money don't get me wrong <laughs> I, I, I i struggle a lot of my life to get enough money and but i i felt that this was something that bringing money into it would just muddy the waters in all kinds of ways and for example at the moment i'm experimenting with the idea of actually publishing the the newsletter as a physical object too and there as well i've run into the question of of money and at, at the moment at least i think what i'll do is remember this will always be available free of charge to members but as a physical copy i think i will probably just put it up 
with a kind of a five pence profit or something like this. In other words, the absolute minimum possible on a print on demand platform. Um, and I, I have some regrets looking back, but this business about money is not one of them. I'm really, really happy um, about that. Um, I should also say with Kate's comments, I, I'm really happy, Kate, with what you said there, because sometimes I feel rather guiltily that I, I, I have exactly that feeling that sometimes I want information. And so I ask a question um, and I can't think of many other places where I could get that range of knowledge. I mean, specifically about fairies, nowhere. So but I'm really gratified that you feel that, too. And so it's it's not just it's not just me. That's yeah. great. Uh, so we, we, you better tell it, uh, you know, while while we're on the, the, that subject of the actual society, how, uh, if someone's watching this and wants to join, how do they do it? Right. So the thing to do is the gateway is just an email account. Um, and this is fairy investigation society at gmail.com. And I, you have notes with the episode. Maybe we could even write yes. it up there. Yes. But fairy is spelt in the old fashioned traditional way. So it's not F A E, it's F A I R Y. Fairy investigation society, all one word, at gmail.com. And you'd write an email there. And then the second thing you have to do is to be patient. Because I deal with these replies maybe three, four times a year. So sometimes three months goes by before I actually go through and write to everyone. Um, and then you'll get these two emails a year. And that's all I've ever sent out with the attachment of the, um, the newsletter. Um, and then if you're also on Facebook, we can also then sign you into this group, which I think is called Secret Fairies. Um, and yeah, and then there's also this small library. So it's not going to be one of these things that changes your life, but it's another source of knowledge. And like Kate says, it's a way to perhaps meet people with interests across the spectrum that in one way or the other relate to your own. I love the fact that you're thinking about bringing uh, the, the newsletter into physicality. I mean, I, I, for me, and I know I'm not alone with this, I really struggle to, to read things online. I, I, I find it very impersonal having something in front of me on screen. And for the, the physicality of being able to hold something and have something in front of you and, and appreciate it in a material way is, um, is something that I really appreciate. And we'll come on to, to that a bit more about the fairy census and how that, that's developed. Before we um, we go into the fairy census, I mean, I, I've just I've just stumbled across, and I can't believe that I didn't know this. That you, um, as part of uh, the census, that censuses censuses that you've done, um, you did one on boggarts, which um, I, I want to start off with um, asking you what a bogger is. So for those who don't know, I mean, you've done quite a lot of work around the the folklore, haven't you, about this? So what is a boggart? Right. So Boggart, in a sense, has been my obsession for the last 10 years. And if I was a bit more organised, I'd have the book to hand. But um, last year I published two books on Boggart. Um, and one is a study of Boggart. So it's very much my writing. But the other is a source book. And it includes lots of material from the 19th century. Um, it includes the Boggart census, which is now concluded, though I'm still very interested in people have information. And it also includes a, a list of all the Boggart place names I was able to find all the way from Lincolnshire across to Nottingshire, uh, up into the, 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 the foothills of Cumbria. There's this area, particularly in the northwest of England. So what is a Boggart? A Boggart is essentially um, it's a word for any ambivalent, solitary, supernatural being. Um, so it could be Jenny Greenteeth. People in the 19th century very routinely called Jenny Greenteeth a boggit. Um, it could be a poltergeist. It could be a kinder house spirit. It could be, let's see, um, a willow the wisp. Um, the, the one supernatural group, and group is the operative word, that weren't called boggets were fairies. But everything else on the dark side of the ledger um, were boggets, and they were routinely called. And I, I always use this example that if someone in 1880 ran into a pub and said, Oh my God, I've just seen a boggit, 
everyone would know this person that had had a scary experience, but they would have to ask more questions to understand what type of bog it. Um, and in this way, Catherine Briggs and others have done us something of a disservice because they communicated this idea that actually comes from children's literature that a boggit is a naughty house spirit. And this this is part of the story, but it's a tiny, tiny part of the story. Um, it's the equivalent of saying, I don't know, that the Second World War was a, a series of battles fought in North Africa. It was, but it was just so much more than that as well. Um, and yeah, so I ran this boggit census uh, when I was getting the book ready and it really I concentrated my fire on the northwest of England. That's perhaps why, Kate, you didn't come across it. Um, but, Neil, I did actually get some references from Cheshire, your own backyard, at least at the moment. Um, and what, what I was it was different than the fairy census. We'll talk probably about the fairy census suit. But when I was doing the fairy census, I wanted people who'd seen or heard or somehow come into contact with fairies. Um, instead, with the Boggett census, I was interested in anyone who had grown up in a certain area and who had heard the word Boggett. So they would tell me what it meant. But I was also actually interested in people who'd grown up in that area um, before the 1970s and who could emphatically say they had not grown up with the word Boggett. So there's also a lot of negatives in the survey, but there were about a thousand responses. I think there were 1100 in the end. And what was really valuable was it was possible to put on a map and show where Boggett had already died out by the 50s, where it survived to the 70s. And it, for me, this was the biggest shock of the entire project. The few places where it still survives today, where its old meaning still survives. And there are some of the more rural parts of Lancashire in the northwest and also parts of the Derbyshire Peaks where the word survives to this day. And I, I'm getting goosebumps now just talking about this. But I remember reading these accounts and just being amazed that people were still using this vocabulary in the old way. Is there is there other names for the bogger? I mean, does that translate? Is it the boggle? Is it, you know, the goblin? Does it? Because, I mean, obviously in the peaks, I'm not so far away from peak districts. And, you know, there's quite often Boggle's Cave or Boggett's Cave or, you know, th those kind of references. It, is there other names? Yeah, there, there are, it's absolutely a, a, a reflex of dialect. So if you go to other parts of the north of England, you'll just find other phrases for the same thing. So th there's a line I, I, I refer to Boggettdom as the area where Boggets were referred to. But if you go a bit further to the north, so if you leave what used to be called Lancashire across the sands, which is today southern Cumbria, if you leave the southern Cumbrian coast and head north, you get there into what I call Bogledom. These are areas where people would refer to the Bogle. Um, and if you go right across all the way across the borders, including the other side, so the Scottish lowlands, all the way down towards Lincolnshire on the other side, almost all that territory is bogled. And it's territory where people with the exact same meaning, a solitary, ambivalent, supernatural being, would talk about bogle. So the guy would run into the pub and say, oh, my God, I've just seen a bogle. And everyone would say, what was it like? What happened? But there were also a couple of other words. Um, one word that there used to be pre-1974, a county called Westmoreland. And this is today being absorbed into the, the wreck of Lancashire, what's left of northern Lancashire. Um, and Westmoreland, the word that was used was actually Dobie. Um, so people would run into the pub and say, oh, my God, I've just seen a Dobie or Dobie's just chased me. And then I've never been able to get enough evidence for this. But I think that in parts of the North York Moor, the word that was routinely used was bar guest. Now, bar guest, we always read in the fairy dictionaries that bar guest is the big black dog. And I think that in some places it was. But I think there's a part of the North Yorkshire Moors where the sense of the word bar guest was wider. It was this more generic sense. And it seems to coincide with an area where Bogle and Boggett wasn't used. 
So my suspicion is you could draw this dialect map of northern England um, with Boggett, Bogle, um, Doby, Barguest, and then maybe in parts of the northeast, the word Doby was used there as well. So it was used, that's for sure. But I've never quite understood the semantic range. Um, this is the northeast of England where I have much less um, experience with the sources. So, so, I hope so it's not too complicated, but so those so those those regional differences in terms of the actual names and perhaps types of bogarts uh, uh, do do you think that is actually limited to British examples, or do you think there are equivalents? The first thing that comes to mind is like the Irish pucker. So, do, is is there an equivalence there in 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 that instance in 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 the Irish tradition? So look, this is an area where uh, over the past couple of years, I've really got my hobby horse. So excuse what's coming. Um, I, I think that if you study the supernatural, the first thing you have to do in a given area is if there's enough documentation, you have to create a folk taxonomy. You have to understand the different terms that were used. And the problem is that the three of us, and I very, very much include myself in this, um, but I, I'm sure to some extent it's also true of you too, a lot of our knowledge comes from Catherine Briggs, the Fairy Dictionary and similar works. And the problem is what fair, what Catherine Briggs and others did was they got confused with different dialect terms. They they ran into these dialect terms and they did their best to interpret them. Whereas actually often these dialect terms were part of a folk taxonomy with different taxonomic ranks. Um and I, I think that this this causes an awful lot of trouble. And my my impression with Ireland is that things seem to be things are in a sense messier there. And well, are they? It's probably I just don't know the material as well. And of course, with Ireland, you also in the end you need to have Gaelic. And this is something that I have just in a very 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 limited sense. But I, because of my experience of English folklore, I'm now concerned when we use a term like puka, say, in Ireland, is it really what I think it is and what Catherine Briggs has told me it is? And what I've read it as in the Irish sources I've looked at, or is it actually something that's more complicated? What I would say for Ireland is um, Irish folklorists were the first people in Europe to divide between what they called the social supernatural, um, in other words, what we think of as fairies, what they used to call the trooping fairies um, and solitary fairies. And then they there were lots of other supernatural beings like ghosts. And, and I think to some extent um, that that probably is a true reflection. It's almost as if there were three families in Ireland. There were two different types of supernatural solitary beings. There are more fairy-like ones, and then there are the more, um, let's say, ghost-like ones. Um, in Britain, I don't think, well, let, okay, in England, at least in the northwest of England, that's not the case. There's basically the division between the solitary supernatural and the collective supernatural, which are fairies. And then, on the other hand, you also have the good supernatural, so angels, uh, other beings but on the ambivalent side i think there's this division between fairies which are a society traditionally um and then these solitary beings and here the difference between a hob say meaning a house spirit and a ghost i think when you really get down to the sources it is surprisingly plastic how these different forms just ease into each other so neil i don't know if i answered your question there but that would be my yeah no it's it's it's, it's a difficult quest, question to answer and we put it uh, in the future kate we could probably you know get someone like david halpin on, on from to give that irish perspective versus the english or british perspective because there are so many differences and certainly when i started looking into the fairies in some sort of depth i soon realized that it's like almost if you irish fairies and english fairies are almost totally different mm -hmm. they're almost uh, of different species 
with uh, you know a Venn diagram with just a little overlap in the in the middle. And yeah, this is fascinating. I completely completely agree. I, I I suppose my obsession would be if someone was to come to me and say, "Look, I really want to do study this thing in folklore." My advice would be go local. It, don't be shallow. Don't be wide. Go deep. Go local. Because in the end, it's there that you find the that you start to be able to recreate this mental universe. In my case, of the nineteenth century. Um, in other cases, maybe the Middle Ages. Also, yep. I mean, Neil, just to piggyback onto what you're saying there. At the moment, and in fact, I've had a somewhat tense day over this. Um, I'm trying to finish the manuscript of. Um, a number, I think it's 18 different scholars um, with 14 chapters on different types of, let's call them fairies, use the English term, from across Europe. Um, and so this goes from Ukraine to Greece to Spain and Portugal to, uh, we have a chapter from the Lowlands, from the Netherlands, Um Lots of different chapters. There's a chapter from Scandinavia, one from Iceland, one from Ireland, one from the Isle of Man, um, one from one from England, and it's um, it, it really is striking how using that image of the Venn diagram, <laughs> you know, there's probably more that divides these different fairy communities than there is that unites them. It's quite striking. Yeah, so I, go, you... I guess. Oh, so, sorry, Kate, go on. No, no, I was just, I was just about to say you, you you mentioned the Isle of Man there, and going back to the uh, the whole what is bogger in each area, um, I, I'm I'm assuming that that includes sort of apparitions and 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 that kind of uh, paranormal activity. Um, I, you know, I have found out that uh, the Isle of Man they use the word spook or spooks to to include anything supernatural. So uh, I, I would assume that that's their bogger. You know, that 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 overriding overarching terminology. Um, so in terms of how that um, overlays with with paranormal and haunting activity, what kind of activity can we see from the boggarts from uh, from the census? What kind of things what kind of things do they get up to? Look, I, so my guess would be if you look at English examples all the way, say, from Bedfordshire, all the way up to the northwest, I think you would find the range relatively similar. It's not completely, and there are some interesting exceptions, but what changes is the terminology and maybe also to some extent the way that the terms relate to each other, how they do, whether you have subcategories. I mean, it makes it all sound impossibly dry like this, but this was these were terms that were used by people who understood them, and this was the way they processed the universe um I, and as far as boggets go i mean the first thing i would say with boggets is not 99 percent, not even 90 percent, but 80 percent of the time when someone says i saw a boggit they mean a ghost right and again and again the word boggit is used to apply to ghosts now as we know um the word ghost also covers um a number of sins i mean there, there are lots of different types of ghosts as well if you think of poltergeist if you think of a white lady walking through the grounds um but the the dead or the unquiet dead is a very very big category of boggit um and so there's a lot of there's a lot of different forms of ghost life and then perhaps there's also that fascinating form that, that pretty much disappears with the Great War, but which survives up until the very end of the 19th century. But the classic experience that you're walking through the night and you come face to face with something that perhaps shouldn't be there, say, um, uh, you know, a seven foot tall woman or something like this. And suddenly the woman changes into a luminous sheep and then she changes into a bale of hay that starts rotating. And then this is the, the English shape change that goes back in our records, not to our earliest records, but certainly to our earliest post-Norman records. And that we just get a glimpse of in the 19th century as 
he, she, it is disappearing forever or or perhaps is evolving into the black dog and the alien big cats and this new, more modest form that will take us through the interwar period. So there's also that. And then also the northwest of England, which was where the Boggett census was pretty much focused. Um, you also get the examples of what I think of household helpers. Now, sometimes these are ghosts. But these are spirits, ghosts in the sense they're supposed to be spirits of someone who's died in the house. But these are spirits that in one way or the other help the family. And sometimes they have rather, you know, tricksy, difficult relations with the family. Um, but they at least claim to be on the family's side. So when, when did the terminology, when did the term boggart start dying out? And have you sort of pinpointed why that was, why we don't use it as an overarching um, overarching name for, for the supernatural. Right. So the earliest records, just to give you the whole range, the earliest records we have to bog it actually date back to the 1500s. And one of the things that always blows me away with the English supernatural, and I don't know, Neil, as a fellow historian, if, if he's had similar challenges to his historical prejudices. But as a historian, I go in expecting constant evolution and change. And I'm it's just my default, my expectation. And I am amazed when you look at supernatural records, how things stay the same in the English countryside over centuries. Um, and you only get glimpses of it because there are fewer sources. But in as much as there are sources, you seem to just have the same supernatural system over centuries and centuries. And this starts to come apart, I suppose, in the 19th century. Um, in the late 19th century, there's a, a, a period where dialect literature in the 19 in the northwest, particularly Yorkshire, the West Riding, Lancashire, even Westmoreland is very big. Um, and then that dies out by the very early 1900s. And I would say the worst period is that period from, say, 1900 to the Great War, because dialect just gets forgiven the language, but shafted in that period. It, it really becomes a mark of low status, low education. And boggit is a word which is very strongly inserted in, in dialect. In other words, someone speaking standard English probably just wouldn't say boggit. They'd say, oh, I saw a ghost or something else. And so you can, to some extent, thanks to the boggit census, see where the word starts to die out in different areas. Um, and I split people who knew the word up into three groups. Um, I think the terms were um, a, a boggit rememberer, a boggit knower and a boggit speaker. In other words, there were people who you said, what does boggit mean? And they'd say, God, I haven't heard of that for years. But when I was a kid <laughs> and they had these fabulous memories of when the word was used, perhaps in a very striking moment. And it's interesting, there were about 10 people who remembered it in relation to horses going wild. Um, because you can imagine a six-year-old who sees a horse lose control. And in Northwestern dialect, that was take boggit. And so they remembered this. And then there were people who never used the word, but they passively recognized it quite easily. It wasn't part of their vocabulary, their active vocabulary, but it was part of their passive vocabulary. Um, but they they very much knew what it was when it came along. And then there was this group that, again, just blew me away, that were people that were just, just very routinely using it back in 2019, 2020, when I was really hammering away at this. Um, and I remember one woman writing to me from an office in Derbyshire saying, I, I used that word just now. Uh, you know, I, I literally shouted at someone in the office that they're a boggit. Um <laughs> And another woman said, yeah, I saw some idiot had done fly tipping down the road. And I said that dirty boggit. <laughs> uh, part of the semantic range of boggit is this idea of people who uh, don't behave by social norms are often a little bit dirty outside the pale in one way or the other. Um, so I, I think I guess that's the long answer. The short answer is boggit died with dialect. We should yeah, bring it back, but, and we should bring it back as an insult as well. It's a, it's a charming insult, it's, it's a and I'm gonna, I'm going to start using that one. Now, well, uh, now, Kate, you're a bogger. Now, stop it. So <laughs> I, I, need, I need to say something. <laughs> um, I, I I'm really tempted, and I'm not I'm not going to push this 
I just want to mention it and then we'll move on because we have other things to talk about. But I'm wondering if we can call um, UFO occupants and abduct abduct abductioners bogarts the ufo bogarts but we're not going to go down the ufo route you'll be pleased to hear simon because um yeah you you don't we don't we don't need to do that because we don't have 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 time but what we definitely want to talk about is going back to the fair investigation society and the census not the bogart census the census which was um oh let me get uh 2014 to 2017 Ferry Investigation Society, yourself, carried out a survey and accumulated over 500 um, uh, reports of people's interactions with fairies. So, and, and, and as we'll come on to, there is a new census being produced at the moment. So let's, let's go back to the, the, the initiation of that census in 2014, or I guess before 2014, why were you doing it um and just give us some of the methodology that you applied to 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 that to that census to try and make it as structural as possible yeah methodology is a very polite word for what i was doing but uh, (laughs) there was certainly an attempt so 2014 i was finishing editing marjorie johnson's notes that then became this marvelous book seeing fairies um And I was fascinated by the way that Marjorie Johnson was one of two people in the 20th century who had put together a selection of fairy sightings. The first of these, of course, was Walter Evans Wentz, who, after his doctorate at Oxford in 1911, released The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. And I personally find the second two thirds of that book almost unreadable. But the first part is all these wonderful descriptions of people in Brittany, Cornwall, um, Man, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. Hope I've not missed anyone out. Having fairy encounters. Um, And they're marvellous. They're they're such fun to read. And then Marjorie Johnson from the 1930s, literally to the 1990s, her last, um, her last, um, I think, the latest rather entry in Seeing Fairies was one of her home helps. Um, who had a, an experience in her house that doesn't surprise me in the least. Now, the thing about Walter Evans Wentz and Marjorie Johnson, they were both doing these surveys as believers. Um, Walter Evans Wentz, to the best of my knowledge, never saw fairies, though he desperately, desperately wanted to. There's a wonderful passage in the fairy faith where he camps outside the door to the world of fairy in the heights and the Scottish island, hoping that this door will open. And it's one of my favourite memories of Walter. Um, And then Marjorie Johnson was someone who did have a daily relationship with fairies. She saw fairies constantly. And but both of them from these different angles, they had an aim and their aim was to prove the existence of fairies. Now, I, as I said before, I'm much more agnostic about these things. And so my aim, I thought, wouldn't it be great to do this? But instead of doing it, focusing on the fairies, because as far as I'm concerned, you're never, it's like nailing jelly to the wall. It's just never going to work. Um, Wouldn't it be great if I could do a survey that didn't focus on the fairies, but on the people who saw them? Um, and so this has always been the idea at the back of my mind. Now, this it it began at the same time as the start of the Fairy Investigation Society. And Neil, you're absolutely right to link it to the Fairy Investigation Society, because in my early documentation, I said under the aegis of the Fairy Investigation Society. But the truth is, the census was always I, I, I got advice on various points from people but it was very much my work. I, I mean, I, I put the survey together. I used my judgment for good and for bad in creating the questions. Um, and uh, so often my my American ally, Chris Woodyard, helped me a lot, particularly in the closing stages. But it was basically my work. And um, I, I, I ran through... Um, I I basically got as much publicity out as possible to get people who'd had fairy experiences to get in touch. And since then, a number of other people 
have done these kind of surveys but I, I I was the first of the modern surveys. And since then, various people, we mentioned Joe before, have done it from different angles. Um, but my way was to do it in a very remote, rather impersonal way that people would fill out this description of, for instance, um, how old were they when they did the survey? What time of day roughly was it? Uh, do they have visual issues? Uh, one of my favourite questions, do they always regularly or very rarely have supernatural experiences and then also some questions at the end for instance why was this thing that you saw a fairy rather than say an alien going back to your point neil from before or a ghost and so using this i was then able to put together 500 of these damn entries and I say damn because obviously I'm incredibly grateful to the people who brought these into being and were kind enough to send me accounts. But when I finally decided to put it together in book form, um, I thought it was going to take me a week and it took me one of the hardest five or six weeks of my life. <laughs> I mean, I really worked hard. Because to get all the data and to put them entry after entry and then put the entries in order and then proofread them, it was, I mean, it was very satisfying, but it was very, very wearing. I bet I bet it was. Is uh, you need a secretary, really, uh, Simon? I think that's the that's the answer to that. My, it's my next my next stage. Yeah. Uh, but but it's uh, it's it, it, the other thing which you didn't mention is that uh, all of the reports are anonymous, and that was obviously an important thing because people uh, it's become less so now, but people are often afraid to talk about especially fairy encounters more so than maybe aliens or, or ghosts or other or, or cryptids uh, that, that seems more acceptable although that's changing i think in the last few years but so so they're all anonymous and um if you don't if you don't mind can it, just to give viewers who, who are unfamiliar with it can i just read out one that's one of my favorites and i've used it a couple of times in in my articles as a, as a nice sort of typical example so so this was from the 1990s and a female in her 20s um it, it won't take long it's only just a paragraph so this is number 114 in the census uh friends had gone ahead and i straggled behind as i turned a corner it was misty the mist had a weird glow as i walked into the low mist there was a procession they were about three feet tall with lanterns but in the mist i paused and they saw me they came forward and i waited for them to pass they passed i have never taken drugs and i was not on any alcohol this was the weirdest experience it lasted three to five minutes by the time i got back to my cottage they my friends were concerned as i was away for 45 minutes very strange they looked medieval in dress but their clothes were covered by mist at the time so that, that's a very interesting one on, on many levels i don't expect us to, to break it down no although although the time lapse is you know a typical a typical fairy um motif uh so so that's that's the sort that that's kind of a typical entry that sort of length of entry and the person not really coming to any conclusions but just this is a strange experience these were fairies and um and and here it is it, do, do, would you agree that that's a sort of typical entry in the set in the census yeah i i think it's one of these things where it's very difficult to talk about an average um because so one of the things i worked very hard at with the census or rather didn't deliberately didn't work hard at was i tried not to filter the results that were coming in now this actually is probably we don't know but my suspicion is this is rather different from marjorie johnson i think that if marjorie johnson if i'd given her this pile of 500 she would have broken it down and got rid of 100 because she would have said these are just not relevant these are not actually fairy sightings um, and this was because marjorie johnson was in the nicest possible way and the census is dedicated to her so I'm sure no one will interpret this in, in a, a nasty way, but she was doctrinaire. She knew what fairies were. And to some extent, she was going to go out and defend the category. Whereas I, I think here, my agnosticism gave me in this, maybe not in other areas, but here a little bit of an edge 
that I was going to just pretty much let anything that someone interpreted as a fairy experience in. And I always give this insane example, um, and insane may even be the correct word here, but I had one example from the United States of someone who was, it's only about two sentences long, but someone had a shower and started communicating with Michael Jackson's spirit. And this was somehow equated with a fairy experience. Now, I was really tempted just to miss that out. And this is really an outlier. It really is at the very extreme distance from what we think of as fairies. But in the end, I left it in. Um, and then there are other examples that I'm very happy I left in. Um, for example, there's that beautiful instance from the United States, from somewhere in the Midwest, where a young man, and I think he's 18 or 19, wakes up in the night. He has the classic experience of paralysis, something that the three of us know well. Sorry, not necessarily for ourselves, but from the literature. Um, and a figure walks into the room and this figure has a huge lemon head. Um, and he compares it to some American brand of sweets where there's this great lemon lozenge. I mean, I, I, in another century, this would have been a demon, of course. But today people would classify it. I think fairy has become to some extent a hold old category for things that don't fit elsewhere. So. I would agree, Neil, that you're right, that this is a pretty standard account. But my God, there are lots of outliers there. And um, and that that in itself is something interesting. I mean, it would be great to get Marjorie Johnson back and have a go through it with a red pen. Um, I, I was really struck by, I, I'm sure you both know the name Michael Swords. Mike is this great American researcher who looks at fairies. And Mike's reaction was something similar. He's very interested in fairy encounters. And he just went through the census and he basically put a red line through half of them because for various reasons for him, they don't count. Hmm. Um, and I, I get this and I, I think you can do this. I'm not. And, and Mike's work is really some of the most exciting for me to read. But I, I think you have to be aware that it's quite a quite a strong step to take just to start editing stuff out like that yeah, yeah. no i like i like the approach you you, you take just so, sorry kate just one one more thing that i really want to mention about the cent the 2014 17 census is that a, a lot I, I don't know the percentage but a, a lot of people when asked what do you think you encountered would say nature spirits which obviously if we went back a hundred years they wouldn't be saying nature spirits i'm not saying nature spirits haven't been part of the taxonomy since well paracelsus maybe even before but uh, a lot of certainly evan vents's um fairy encounters were very rarely described as nature spirits maybe maybe a few examples but it's not interesting as... but evans wentz is fascinating there because already theosophy is starting to leach in not to a community in western ireland but to uh, for example he talks to ae at one point um there are also a couple of the cornish references where theosophic terminology leaches in um and but but yeah before this i i absolutely agree it, it just wouldn't have been the norm yeah, whereas in this census, you know, a lot of people, they're nature spirits. That's how they, especially when, obviously when they're encountering them out, outside. So so, so with the census, there's a, there's a new one happening, isn't there? Um, can I, can I just interject there? Cause I've, no, I've sorry, got, Kate. No, 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 that's okay. Because I, I, I don't want to leapfrog off of that without saying, you know, for, for, for me, that kind of the, the word fairy, and I think for a lot of people has become something that encompasses the other. So it's the, it's the non-categorization uh, of things, much as you were talking about the boggart um, sort of spanning over a whole realm of supernatural things. For me, fairy is is that, that that's spanning over, and it's a way of people being able to, I suppose, grasp hold of, of their encounters and, um, and, and what they uh, experience. The question that I've got for you, Simon, is um, it interesting me of where did you see this information going how did you see this information being disseminated and used um, and I'm, as I'm sure you, you have um, so wh where do you see that info going right um, so when I when I did it um, I mean first of all it, as always with these things there was a selfish base I, I was really 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 interested in this material 
And so I wanted to to do something that would help me. And I had this idea that if I found different aspects that interested me, I could write articles about it. And in fact, since 2017, when it came out, I th I've written two or three 14 times style articles, you know, slightly general, but I've also written two academic articles on different aspects. And so in a sense, I was creating my own data set, but there was also this, this more altruistic side that I, I really wanted to get out into the world a data set that people could use, a data set that people could play around with. And I've been really gratified. I mean, there were about six or seven people I can think of um, who have used actively. I mean, perhaps even more now, but there were a few who've repeatedly used it, let's say. And I, I find I find that that's something that I really like. And as we were saying before, um, I'm just in the process of actually publishing finally the first fairy census as a series of three volumes. Um, but the PDF will always be free and will always be online. So again, it's there for anyone to use if they need it. Um, and when people get in touch with me and say, do you give me permission to use this? I blanket always say yes. I mean, if someone said, do you give me permission to, you know, take a third of the census and publish it? I, I'd say no. But if people are saying, look, I want to do an article and quote three or four thousand, that's fine. Absolutely fine. Um, and so my hope was to get it out into to get it out into the world to encourage research, including my own research, and just have some data that we could play with. I mean, for example, Neil's point before about nature spirits. I think the three of us know this, but it's really useful to be able to do it empirically and to be able to say 260 people actually use the word nature in their account. Um, and so I, I wanted to bring science to the equation. Now, of course, there's there's always the illusion here that you can bring science to something like fairy law. And of course you can't. But I think you can to some extent with the perceptions of people that have these experiences. So, so, where, so where are we with the new, where, what, what's, uh, how is it progressing with the new census or right. the census number two? So I, I, knowing that I was going to talk to you guys today, I actually spent about an hour going through all the accounts I've got so far. And for the first time, I counted them. Now, I did this in a bit of a spasticated way, and I may have got some things wrong. Um, but I think that at the moment, I'm at about 360. OK. And for me, um, I I. I I don't need to. So the first census was 500. But if I can get to 400, I will go ahead and publish the next census. And I'm confident that if I gave myself the summer, I'd get to 400. The, the terrible sword of Damocles, which is hanging above me, is I remember how grim that period was. <laughs> But going back, Neil, to your comment of you need a secretary and it, it's 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 going to be several weeks and it's going to be it's going to be wonderful. But at the same time, it's going to be dull, 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 just going through. And then there's this moment at the end where you've got all of this material, you've got the data and it's it's fantastic. Um, but I'm uh, I'm dreading that. And it's the kind of thing that. God forbid that anything should go wrong. But if I have a big migraine in the autumn, I might put this off even to next year and try and go for 500. But I I would be, I, I said last year that I hope to get it done in 2022 or 2023. I would actually be disappointed if there's not a new fairy census by the end of 2023. Um, and that this will be um, 400. Um, and I hope very much to publish this from the get go um, as physical books. And probably if there are 400, there might be two volumes rather than three. Um, and then also publish it as a PDF. And my aim, just to go that step further, is when I go through my list of life goals with the fairy census, I want to get to 2000. That's that's where I'm going. So I like to think there will be fairy census one, two, then three, four, and probably five. And then I think I will stop. But 
if we continue, I mean, the first one took four, this is taking a decade. So my guess is it will take another, it will take another 15 years to get to 2000 if we continue at this rate. Um, but when we get there, that will be what? It will be 2014 to 2040. So let's say 2015 to 2050. And maybe by then, sorry, to 2040. And by then, I, I really, I think I'll give up. But I hope so. <laughs> takes over. And I hope that this is data that then remains. Um, so how do, how do people, can people still contact you with their experiences to, to make it to part of the census? Oh my God, yes, yes, yes. I mean, I am desperate. If you meet someone in a pub who says, this happened to me, please, your next census should be, there's this weirdo in Italy called Simon Young. And then, and what anyone who's listening, what I would say is just go to Google, type in the words fairy census, and the first thing that will come up is my page on my fairy site, The Fairiest. And it will give you an option of either doing the survey as a first person account, or there's also actually a much less used survey where people have heard of you know, a friend of a friend. My sister had this experience and people write it up in the third person. And then if for whatever reason you're just sick of both of these approaches, just look for me online. It's very easy to do and write to me with your fairy experience. And in the first fairy census, I think there were 70 or 80 what I call C accounts where people had just sent me an email and I try and get the absolute basics, you know, that this is somewhere in America, that this was the 1970s. But it's really the absolute basics. Um, and so any of these approaches work. And again, if someone's watching this video in 2038, if I'm still alive, my suspicion is I'll still be going with this thing. <laughs> I want to get to 2000. That's my aim, because I think with 2000 and with the with a searchable PDF and also with Excel sheets, this starts to be something where you can really mess around and have fun with the data. And you can do so from the point of view of a skeptic. You can do so from the point of view of a believer. I don't care. But the data's out there um, and it's it's being used. So that's it. it I'm assuming this is worldwide. So it's, it's from anywhere globally that, that right. you are accepting. I mean, I, I look forward to the day that finally I have a sighting from Antarctica. And that's <laughs> not happened yet. But anywhere, anyone in the world. And also, I have to say, if the person you meet in a pub happens to be Spanish or French or German, we can do it in other languages. In the first sentence, I think there was one in French and five or six in Spanish. The problem, if we can call it that, is inevitably things still travel with language. And the majority of people who replied replied from the English speaking world. And so it's interesting that the way I've broken down the three volumes um, into geographical areas, the first volume is Great Britain and Ireland. The second volume is the United States and Canada. Uh, and that's the biggest by far. And then the third volume is Australia. Well, no, Australasia. I think there's one from Fiji and several from New Zealand too. Um, Europe, in other words, continental Europe, and the rest of the world. There are a couple from South America. There are none from Africa in the first one. In the second census, I'm not quite mm. sure, but the same pattern repeats itself. These are mainly speaking people from the English-speaking world. And I think that when I've done my peer-reviewed articles on the fairy census, I've tried to make this into an advantage to say that, look, actually, it is useful because we're we're drawing on one large Anglophone cultural area. But in some ways, it's a little bit disappointing. So if you're a Portuguese speaker out there and you just get in touch with me, you write the email in Portuguese, I'll sort it out. Um, I'll, I'll get you in the survey. One of my favourites from the first census is an encounter in the Brazilian rainforest, which is absolutely haunting, um, terrifying. And so so there's room for that as well. But realistically speaking, Kate, it tends to be people yeah, from the English speaking world. 
Is that because um, when you put out, I know that you put out in 14 times uh, for people to, to join in the census, is that because it's not uh, not reaching out um, to, to, to other countries? Have you been able to, to sort of connect with other countries to reach out to other people? Yeah, I, I think it comes down to my lack of effort. And, and, and that in turn comes down to there only being so many hours in the yeah. day. Uh, I mean, I, I could work hard to try and get myself into Italian newspapers, into Spanish newspapers or, well, into social media in these areas. And if if I knowing that I was going to be on this podcast today and knowing that I was going to talk about the fairy census got me to thinking a bit about the future. I really do think I'll finish the second one um, in 2023 and I think there will be a push on my part to get as many new accounts in um, over the next months. And when that happens, maybe I could start experimenting with reaching out to people with Spanish social media, Portuguese social media, um, French social media. Um, and probably I won't do it on my own, but perhaps I'll ask allies to do it on my behalf. Um Oh, but, definitely. My question was not a reflection on the hard work that you put in, Simon, at all. It's just no, but it, no, but it is a reflection. But no, but rightly so, in the sense that I, I do lots of things in my life and um, this is just five percent. And so in the end, um, I spend a lot more time in the end on folklore and this the supernatural, the actual lived experience side is something rather small. And in the end, I have decided to limit myself. I mean, I could give myself to this completely. Mm -hmm. Maybe on some levels, Kate, I think that what I've done is enough to yeah. give people a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I don't need to, that, that then I feel a bit less guilty about studying other things or, you know, spending some more time with my, my kids or, <laughs> or what have you. Um, but it, it could be done better. No, I, I don't think you should feel guilty at all. I think that, uh, I mean, it's it's a massive body of, body of work, even to undertake just for uh, the British Isles. It's a massive body of work to to be able to to collate all that. Let alone the, I mean, having that you know the goal of having it global is just mind blowingly good. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and of course, there you would really the term. What you said before about fairy struck home that what do we mean by fairy today? Um, and you said it's become itself quite a wide term. And it's true. I'm always obsessed with terminology from the past. But of course, we have our shifting terminological goals in the present, too. You're, you're absolutely right. And this is something that I think I took a long time to get my head around. But the word fairy just doesn't mean the same thing as it did in the 19th century. Now, imagine if you add into that confusion the babel of different languages. I mean... Huge, absolutely huge. Can I, I can I ask one question? I know that Neil will be itching to ask, uh, you know, a ton of questions, but did the second census differ um, to the first census? Uh, were, were, was there marked shifts in, in people's experiences or the kind of general flavour of it? It's too early to say. So what happens is people do the survey or they send me references and I very quickly look through them. So I do have a kind of general view. Um, but as far as actually really getting down to looking at it in detail, that will be when it's all in one document and I'm proofreading. It. And I think then things will start to become evident. I mean, I, I'm very curious to see if certain trends perpetuate themselves or if certain trends grow. Um, for example, um, uh, um, our, 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 I think mutual friend Mary in the Fairy Investigation Society, um, she identified that I hadn't really noticed, but these peculiar tree-like beings that are like Ents in Tolkien. Um, and she noted that there were several of these in the fairy census. I'm very curious to see whether that grows, um, whether we're going to find more. And then there were some of the old favourites. One of the things that most fascinates me um, are, I mean, it, it always sounds a bit strange, and I'm rather wary when I say this to um, people I perhaps don't know very well, but children having fairy experiences in bed. I mean, it's a niche market, but you have kids aged between four and 18. They go to bed 
and they have these experiences. And in fact, one of my articles was solely focused on this because I just found it so fascinating. And these continue. They continue gloriously. Um, in fact, one thing I was thinking about today, I went out on a walk and I thought it would be really great to do um, a volume in my series, the, the one that Neil held up before, um, where I just look at supernatural experiences of children in bed at night or maybe in some cases, children who are real in bed, but, you know, a similar thing, um, because there are lots in Marjorie Johnson, there are lots in the two fairy censuses, but there were also several from earlier centuries as well that you could pick out and put in. It's a really, really interesting field, that one. The, the trouble with that, Simon, is that you're going to have to go down the Joshua Cutchin route and start talking about aliens abducting children um and you know where, where where does that stop that could be a that could be a five volume uh sort of work <laughs> it could be i i mean I, I i find sleep so interesting as a phenomenon hmm. and i perhaps have this idea that children are particularly unfiltered in their experiences though often you have then all the complications of memories because people are looking three decades back but i i agree that um imagine a little pamphlet or small booklet entitled you know, children and fairies at night something like this i mean you're absolutely right that it, it, the borders would be i mean just ridiculously porous i mean why should you leave out a sasquatch experience or a ufo experience um it, it would only be neil for my convenience i think <laughs> that i would do it as fairies so i agree with you that in the end um there was a metaphor that many years ago i used in an article where i said that we have these different islands of the supernatural. We have the Sasquatch, the alien, the UFO, as well, uh, fairies, ghosts. And that, but as far as I'm concerned, they're just the peaks of a submerged continent. In the end, they all belong to the same body. Um, and uh, I, I don't really trust my intuitions in this area, but as far as intuitions go, that would be one of my few certainties in this field. Yeah, that's good. That's a good way of putting it. I think if you go down one of these rabbit holes, like you say, you, you, you're never coming back if you if you kind of depth dive too much. And it's a you have to draw a line, don't you, about um, about how far you go and how how deep into things you go. I, I think particularly for me, so a lot of my work is just folklore, um, where I'm looking at folklore beliefs. And of course, I love it when you have supernatural experiences, but it's really about folklore beliefs, so shared beliefs in communities, particularly historical communities. And I, I just find it so much more manageable. Um, yeah. I mean, it sounds very amorphous and uh, all a bit confused. And it is. But in the end, if you've got enough data, you can manage it. Where I look at the kind of writing that Neil does or Josh Kutchin and uh, Kate, what you say about the rabbit hole, I, I, I just I, 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 I would. I mean, Neil, you have a background in traditional. I, I was looking at one of Neil's um, historical articles from a decade or so ago, and you have a background in that. I, if I if that part of my life disappeared, I, I would just I, I would feel that I lost my last connection with terra firma. Mm. Um, <laughs> and so when I do these little bits of supernatural writing, I, I have fun with them. But I know that in the end, I'm never really going to make progress, at least empirical progress. Um, I, I, and when so again, I really admire Josh's work, but I, I just, yeah, where does it end? It's mm. just you're you're walking into the mist, and there's no way out. Mm. Um, and... I think that's one of the fantastic things about it for me that, um, you know, that the, not only does the rabbit hole never end, but there is a series of interconnecting warrens that you can definitely get lost in. And it, you know, it, you do have to keep very, very grounded about what, what your starting point is and what your purpose is for, for, for going down them. Because, I mean, the, there are massive bodies of work out there that the complexities of how they join, join things up like Josh's and, um, and other texts, you know, the Mothman prophecies, et cetera. And you just think, 
you know it's like wh- where do you where do you end but that in for me is the essence of fairies that that trickster that shifting that that um you know that feast that's never ever the same it's 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 all um under under that umbrella it, it, it's just massive i think we're gonna have to round it up a bit i know that there was um obviously there's the the last push for the second of the the fairy census to to get people and please if you're watching this don't think that that doesn't um you know include you that if you've had an experience um that that it's not worthy of going in a census i think uh, simon okay, what... what you've just said the word worthy is really important um all of this stuff is anonymous um but for instance there's someone in the first census who had as we all have had in our lives a really important dream where a fairy woman came to her communicated this fact um she woke up she was a changed person that went in. I was really happy to put that in the census because for that person, that was a fairy experience. So don't downplay something. But I, I love the word worthy. Everything's worthy. Yeah. It is. And it, it's all about that joined up. And for me as well, reading the census, somebody who I, I, I do believe in fairies. There you go. Um, and, and reading other people's experiences is is uh, really comforting. And it's really, um, I think, for a lot of people who have anomalous experiences, just hearing other people, ha- you know, say that's happened to me, something very, very similar. It kind of makes you feel less mad in the world, you know, and, and less alone that there are other nutcases out there that have had these experiences. So for, for that, don't feel as though, like like Simon says, the, the, these things are anonymous. You, do, you don't have to give your name. Um, just write it up. And it becomes, for me, it becomes incredibly important data um, when, when we're looking into, into research or even just, you know, for our for our own kind of squirreling about with the, with the research and, um, and finding things out. I, I find it absolutely fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Experiences are definitely something that, that uh, piques my my interest it's um it's that why are people having in the psychology about it and, and all those different elements so please get in contact with simon about the the second fairy census um I, he would love to hear from you um what what's happening what what's new what where where are we going from here oh, where are we going from here the census is enough but um what else have you got going on that you'd like people to be aware of well, um, I, I, I have started over the past few months this, um, well, really the past two or three years, um, I started to try and create a tiny print on demand publishing house with folklore and supernatural text. Um, and this is called Puka Press, so P-W-C-A. Um, and I've been giving some time to that. And I I use Amazon as a platform and I've, I've found that between the three of us, a very frustrating experience. Amazon is, um, um, it just drives me mad sometimes. I had a high blood pressure day with them yesterday. Um, but I hope to keep going. And my aim there, I have this series called the Fairies and Fairy Law series. And what I want to do is get to about 100 of these books and pamphlets eventually. So different volumes of different areas of fairy law. And I think at the moment, I'm, I can't remember, but perhaps I'm at eight or something like this. But I've got all of the other ones waiting to go as long as um, Amazon doesn't become so frustrating. And then the other thing I've done that I found really exciting over the past year and a half. Um, I mentioned before my dear American friend, Chris Woodyard, who is this inspired uh, author who lives in Ohio um, and who's written a lot on the supernatural and is a specialist in of all things wardrobes and clothes and the supernatural there she's a very very interesting uh, person and we together for the last year and a half have done a podcast and this podcast is called bog it and banshee and the premise of this podcast was that i think that i was supposed to be a bit more skeptical and chris was supposed to be um, perhaps less skeptical and we do, in the nicest possible way, get on each other's nerves a bit with our views. And so it's supposed to be a conversation where each month, we just do one a month, so it's a very modest thing. We look at one famous supernatural incident. So, for example, we did an episode on the Woolerton Gnomes. Um, I'm just thinking we've, we what was our last one? We did one on late American witch cases. So we try and pick a fairly circumspect area and then talk about it Um, and for me it's always a really exciting experience because 
I, 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 it must be like this with you two, but I feel that me and Chris, we, we, we complement each other's gaps. And by the end of the conversation, I really feel that I've learned something. In other words, we do it as a podcast, but actually just for purely selfish reasons. I look forward because I don't think I've ever sat down to do a podcast with her where I've not left knowing more than when I started. Um, and so that, that's been something. Anyway, it's called Bog It and Banshee. And we send out a new episode on the first of every month. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I think, well, Neil, have you got anything you, you want to add? Anything that you want to sort of slip in there? Well, no, I, I think we are out of time, aren't we? But uh, just, you know, thank you so much for your time, Simon, and your great depth of knowledge. And uh, as, as I know we say this on almost every time we talk to someone, but, you know, we have scratched the surface of some of these subjects and you could go on for hour after hour, but um, uh, I, 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 I'm sure you wouldn't appreciate that tonight. So, <laughs> so, so, my final word is just say so, so thank you so much, Simon. And maybe, maybe we can make a half appointment in a year's time when hopefully the second fairy census will have been out for three or four months. You guys will have had time to read it and digest it. Um, I'll be buzzing with ideas about what I found, particularly Kate's point about are we seeing certain trends grow? Are other ones withering away? Um, so maybe in a year we'll have a chance um, to visit again. As the brilliant, event. yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon. It's always a pleasure to have you on board and and chat through uh, what's going off. And and thank you very much to the fairy godfather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll see you soon.